So uh, welcome to the Special Purpose Operating System Working Group meeting, part of TAG Runtime under the CNCF. Uh, we follow the CNCF Code of Conduct, which is linked in the document, uh, the agenda document, which I just pasted again in the meeting chat. Um, feel free to add yourself to the list of attendees and um, any notes you'd like to capture in there. Otherwise, I will hand things over to Andrew uh, to talk about Talus. All right. Um, can you guys see what I'm sharing? Resume share. Okay, there we go. Cool. All right. So um, my name is Andrew Reinhardt. I'm the CTO and founder here at Sidera Labs. Um, I created Talos Linux about eight years ago. Man, that's crazy. I created Talos Linux eight years ago. Um, I was a heavy user of Kubernetes at the time, um, less so now that I have a company to run, funny enough. Um, and I found myself kind of frustrated with how Kubernetes management was done and how there was a ton of overlap between what I was doing at the operating system level and at the Kubernetes level, both you know, to give some examples user management, hardening, updating, patching, whatever, you know, there's basically parallels between the two layers that I wanted to get rid of. Um, and so I created Talos Linux. And one of the first things that um, if you've done any looking at Talos Linux that you'll notice is that everything in Talos Linux is API managed. We have no SSH and we have no shell. There is no way to access the idea of a console within Talos. Everything is a gRPC API. Um, and I make this, I call it API managed here um, because later on in my next slide, you'll see that there's, there's a di distinction between how the state of Talos is driven. I say API managed here because um, the API is really meant to solve the problem of, okay, I have no shell, I have no SSH, things are going wrong. How do I figure out what's going on? Um, and really, when you ask yourselves, what do you need from a shell and SSH when those scenarios come up is you need data. You need to be able to debug. You need to find out what's going on. And so the API is for getting those types of things. It's for submitting configuration to Talos. Um, it is not necessarily for making changes to Talos. Changes come from the configuration file. The configuration file is something we call the uh, machine config. The machine config contains everything from networking to kernel parameters to how the kubelet should be configured to the control plane and anything in between. Um, Talos is completely declarative. There is no popping on and running an aux sed grep and running this command and touching that file. It is all driven via this configuration file. Um, in fact, it's very heavily inspired by Kubernetes in that there is a controller pattern that is baked into Talos. Talos comes with its own PID1, does not have system D. Um, we wrote this from the ground up for the purposes of running Kubernetes. And so we had the opportunity to use a lot of the patterns that are used in Kubernetes. Again, controller pattern. When you submit a configuration file to Talos Linux, that configuration file is then broken down into unique bits of other configuration files that are user used internally. Um, so for example, when you submit the configuration file and there's maybe some um, non-standard networking settings like bonding or so, you know, or some DNS resolvers or something that you want, those get broken down into individual bits that controllers within PID1, which are just Go routines, pick up and they can change what that configuration file looks like, publish it to the eventing system, and then something else can pick it up. Maybe when you change networking settings, another file except etsy-resolve.conf needs to be changed. There's another controller that handles that. And so it really takes away from this idea of SSHing in. You ask yourself, okay, I want to change DNS. I want to change X. What are all the files I need to touch with Intellis Linux? We collapse that down to just declaring what you want. And the controller is baked with Intellis Linux will handle that for you. Sorry, Andrew. Is, is um, 
we just see the title page of the presentation is that oh you do okay <laughs> um <laughs> Let me and see. you're describing things great, but I wasn't sure. You know, some people like to just talk to. Uh, yeah, I don't know why that is. Give me a second. Um, All right. Oh, is it working now? Yeah, now I see built for machines. Yeah, OK. So there. API managed, configuration driven. And OK, now we're at this built for machines section. So. What I mean by this is when I set out to build Talos, it was my opinion and still is that humans are typically the problem, um, even outside of technology. But that's another thing that we can discuss in another forum. Um, so what I decided was that humans should not be allowed on these machines. And that influenced um, a lot of the design that we're going to talk about around Talos Linux. A lot of the decisions that were made were really made because of this desire of not allowing humans to touch things, change things. Um, what we've done since I came up with this idea is we've tried to add structure around this. And so um, we have a project called COSI, C-O-S-I. It's the uh, Common Operating System Interface. There is another COSI out there, and it unfortunately came out with the same name at the same time. Um, the idea behind COSI, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, is that we want to bring structured data into the world of like the Unix philosophy, essentially. So what this really allows for is a Linux that is designed for machines, not for servers and not for desktop use. It is designed for automating. And it's all based on this idea of no humans being allowed. So Again, when I first set out to uh, create Talos, it was very heavily inspired by Kubernetes. And one of the things that I um, really loved about containers and why I fell in love with containers really is that you can, sh you can have basically everything that's needed within your app self-contained, obviously, and I'm sure everybody knows this, but your Linux distribution didn't need to be touched. And so, Companies like CoreOS came out with CoreOS, and I always thought that there was a chance and an opportunity to make that even more simple. But not until Kubernetes came about did it really become um, viable because Kubernetes handles scheduling and all kinds of things. And so what we've done is we've boiled down our Linux distribution to a 90 megabyte squash FS. That's all Talos really is. It's a 90 megabyte squash FS plus a kernel. Um, which is really significantly smaller than pretty much any other Linux distribution out there. And what we've done is we've also baked in operational knowledge, as I like to call it, within Talos Linux. So not only is it minimal from a resource usage perspective, it's also minimal in the sense that you don't need a ton of Linux expertise really to run it. Talos, again, runs on controllers and humans aren't allowed to touch it. And so the user interface and the user experience needs to be very, very easy. And so really you just declare what you want and we will go and do all the Linux expertise for you. And so it's minimal in that sense as well. And one of the main goals with this is that we don't want people to worry about Linux anymore. Um, we want to make the operating system disappear. If, if we could have a perfect operating system, it would be one that is literally zero code, right? Um, it would be one that we don't need, but we need operating systems to some degree, but with Kubernetes, we can really significantly slim that down. And so the idea is let's try to boil this down to the absolute essential needed to run Kubernetes. And we wanna make the operating system disappear and all the problems that come with it. So in order to make the operating system disappear, I think having no humans on the machine is important because if you operate from that outlook on things, you have to design the system so that the operating, if, if a human needs to go on there, it can't disappear. And so one of the things that I decided very early on was that it needs to be immutable so that um, it could be highly predictable. Humans can't change anything because humans will find a way to change things. They'll use a Kubernetes pod and maybe schedule it to be privileged and they'll change something and they'll find ways around this. And so that's why SquashFS was chosen. 
squash fs is just inherently read only you can't remount it as read write um it is read only and that's all the options you have around it so it being immutable was really core to this idea of um you know let's make this thing so that humans can't touch it and so that the operating system can can disappear and this has all kinds of benefits you know we find that people are you know finding almost like containers right where you build a container you find an error in one of your run commands you you fix it you iterate you iterate you iterate and then once you get the container built that thing runs pretty predictably wherever you want it this is one of the promises of containers and this is why we fall in love with it and so we've driven in this idea of immutability within Talos to try to achieve that as well. Um, I say that Talos is, is immutable and it's almost entirely immutable. The only places that aren't are slash temp and slash var. Slash temp is the tempfs, which is used by all kinds of processes to do things. And so that's kind of expected. Um, and then slash var is where Kubernetes puts its data, containerd puts its data and etcd puts its data. And we're also finding this is where users want to put their data as well. And so later on in, in, in future versions of Talos, we're going to be coming out with a pretty extensive volume management um, configuration. Uh, sorry, give me one second. Sorry if it's a little loud here. Um, so aside it from uh, aside from being immutable, in order for us to really forget about the operating system, it needs to be ephemeral. Because anything that we can hold on to and love and cherish forever, we tend to do that. Uh, it needs to be something that comes and goes and we can't attach to it. And so to make this happen, we make Talos run completely in RAM. Since, it's, since it is only just a 90 megabyte squash FS, it runs entirely in RAM. Uh, Kubernetes has places to, to put things, as I mentioned, with slash var, but the core of Talos runs completely uh, in RAM. And to, to illustrate one of the benefits of this is um, I like to point out how upgrades work within Talos. So since Talos is running completely in RAM, everything underneath it on an up, when you, when you request an upgrade of Talos stops, we stop all processes, we unmount all partitions and we reinstall Talos essentially. And what all that really means is you're getting another entry within Grub. We have an AB Grub system. So if we're on A, the new Talos version is going to be Grub Entry B. When we when we reboot the new version of Talos, we've actually already wiped the disk. You're actually just reinstalling Talos. And it operates very much like Kubernetes does in the sense that when you quote unquote upgrade your image within a pod, you're getting a whole new container. This is something completely new that Kubernetes rolls out for you. And so I like to use that as a way to illustrate the one of the benefits of of it being ephemeral is that we can really kind of get rid of all the unknown unknowns with cruf laying up between uh, any two uh, upgrades, any two versions of Talos. Um, and it also just promotes the idea of not depending on a node. We're working within Kubernetes. We should not have to depend on any singular node. Of course, we have users who come in and say, okay, but I want to run single node Kubernetes. And we have a flag to say, don't blow away everything. Um, but really Talos was created on this idea of it being ephemeral and not depending on any particular node. So another um, thing that we need in order for us to really forget about the operating system is it needs to be really secure because, well, if you're worried about how secure it is and it has vulnerabilities, then we can't forget about it. So we've gone to great lengths to really secure it. We've, we're um, shipping a, Linux kernel that is hardened with the KSPP guidelines. That's a kernel self protection project. And that project has guidelines that say, you know, you should not enable this. They're basically configuration options that need to be present in order to adhere to their guidelines. And this has been part of Talos since forever. The API is uh, encrypted and, and secured using mutual TLS. And we use all of the latest crypto curves and, and all that stuff. Um, We've also recently introduced it, the idea of trusted boot and what trusted boot is, it's essentially secure boot and disk encryption using TPM. And what we could really offer with this feature within Talos Linux is a completely validated boot process. There is no shim that's validated and then it boots something else. 
this is since Talos is just a 90 megabyte squash FS and a kernel, the entirety, the kernel itself and Talos's init sort of core can be validated using secure boot. And then we can encrypt everything that Talos is installed to using a TPM to secure the keys. So security is really, um, it's not even a, you know, it is just part of our DNA. It's not an afterthought. It is in everything that we do, every decision that we make. Because again, in order for us to forget about the operating system, it needs to be secure, very secure. Talos is also atomic, um, as I'm sure you can imagine, since it is just shipped as an init RAM FS and a kernel, and it is just AD grub entries. The entirety of Talos is you know, when you say you want this version of Talos, you are running that version or you are not. There is no stuck in between. Everything is completely self-contained. One of the problems that we've seen, at least I've seen, with this idea of immutability is it makes things very, very difficult to maintain. I was a huge fan of Packer. I was a huge fan of immutability. Um, but I was not a fan of the build process be behind every single time I needed to update something. I had to have a whole pipeline. I had to run Packer. It was just very, very difficult to maintain. And I, I started to really hate the idea of immutability just because of that. Since Talos runs only Kubernetes and it has a very tightly scoped focus and, and we sort of own the build process and the distro itself is designed around this idea of immutability, We've been able to remedy that and introduce the, the idea of system extensions within Talos Linux. And a system extension, all it really is, since Talos runs as, an, as a squash FS, a system extension is another squash FS that we just layer on top of the base. So it is immutability really that is composable as we're calling it, composable immutability. We have, um, a service that we provide to make this very easy is called the image factory, factory.talos.dev. If you go there, you could say, here's the features I want, to, in the, the uh, system extensions I want enabled within Talos for any version that I want. We call it a schematic. And a schematic basically says, here are the feature sets and, and system extensions I want enabled. And this is how they will apply to any future versions of Talos. And the reason why this is important is because, again, immutability makes it very difficult to just randomly put things onto Talos. But our security uh, also makes it much more difficult because one of the guidelines behind the KSPP project is that um, kernel modules cannot be loaded. Technically, they are loaded within Talos, but one of the exceptions made within this project is that if you are going to enable kernel moduling, kernel module loading, is that they need to be encrypted with a throwaway key that is generated at build time. And the Linux kernel supports this idea. It, it's just a simple flag that you pass in when you build. And so um, the image factory is responsible for saying, okay, this person wants these features and these extensions on top of an immutable operating system, and they want it for this version of Talos. Typically what that means in a more traditional immutable infrastructure paradigm is that you need to go and run Packer builds. You need to compile this for this specific version. The system, the image factory handles all of that for our users. They just say they want this extension and we will build it on the fly, cache it for any future requests from other users. And we will give you a version of Talos um, that has all of the features that you want in it. So, um, Moving on, the other idea behind Talos and the reason we can do a lot of the things that we're doing is that it's single purpose. It is built exclusively to run Kubernetes. That is all that you can do with it. We have people come along and every now and then and say, man, I really love the idea of Talos and I wish I could do this and this with it. But we're, we're very hesitant, I would say, to um, open it up to anything else because I think that the, the reason we can do a lot of the things that we're doing is because it is single purpose built. And what this means is we can we can optimize for the people that want to run Kubernetes in a lot of ways. So it isn't um, it isn't just a container OS. It is an operating system built for Kubernetes. 
Uh, okay, so that kind of touches on a lot of the sort of design ideas behind Talos. And I'll just touch real quickly on um, a feature within Talos that I think is really popular within our community, and that's called Tube Spam. Um, one of the cool sort of benefits of, of Talos, and one of actually one of the goals all along, is that we've we've wanted the ability to run Kubernetes and Talos Linux consistently, regardless of where you are. You can literally run bit for bit the same exact image of Talos on a Raspberry Pi, on a Dell, whatever, on a HP, whatever, um, on Cray stuff. You know, we have people people doing this on some really, you know, data centery type things, and we have people also doing it on home lab things. And it's bit for bit the exact same version. Um, so since you can run Talos identically everywhere, and it gives you this consistent way of running Kubernetes. We wanted to give people a way to span their clusters across those different infrastructures. So to illustrate what KubeSpan does, imagine you have a data center and you just moved off to the cloud because you're tired of their you know, fees and um, you've got your application now running on-prem, but now you're hitting the issue that you originally hit when you decided to move into the cloud. You need to scale up fast. You need to burst. Um, with KubeSpan, this is a simple Boolean flag enablement within Talos. Again, since it's configuration driven, you just say Kubespan enabled true. We will set up an, a, a wire guard mesh between all of the nodes so that you can then say, okay, well, now I'm going to go spin up a, a node in AWS or GCP or wherever else you might want to run it. And it will join this cluster and it will be, you know, completely unbeknownst to, to Kubernetes. It will be on a, on a com entirely different network. And so KubeSpan is a very, very powerful feature that allows our users to use Kubernetes and Talos that spans across multiple infrastructure types. Um, and we're seeing all kinds of really fun patterns come out of this. You know, At the edge, we're seeing people create control planes in the cloud. And then maybe each customer is a node within that cluster. And we're also seeing people do the, the illustration that I talked about, data center centric deployments, being able to burst out into the cloud some really fun things that um, you simply can't do with anything else. Maybe you could hack this together with TailScale, but it's not integrated to the degree that we have this within Talos, and it is literally just a Boolean flag of enabling it to true. Okay, so um, I also want to talk about Cozy a little bit more because I think that one of the reasons why I'm excited about um, this working group is because this is where I felt uh, we we created Cozy a long time ago now, um, but we were sort of trying to get the community together around this idea of an API managed operating system, and so we created the Cozy project. And the idea behind the Cozy project is we have the CNI, we have the CSI, we have the CRIs, and all of the eyes of our community, but we don't have anything around the operating system. And if anyone has ever taken a look at how the Kubelet interacts with the operating system, it is not pretty. And that is not a, you know, a, a knock to the developers, but you know, at times it's shelling out to specific commands. That's, that, you know, there's just so much between the operating system and Kubernetes that happens at the Kubelet layer that it feels like there's a lot of room, there is a lot of room for optimization and, and just improving. And our vision with Cozy is defining what it means to be uh, an API managed operating system. What is it? Can we as an industry come together and agree that, first of all, putting an API in front of Linux is beneficial? And secondly, can we all implement from the same spec? And so the Cozy project is that for us. And in fact, Talos is built entirely on top of the Cozy project. The Cozy project is in its own GitHub space. So we're willing to collaborate with people. We just need to get people on board with this idea. Um, and just diving a little bit more into what Cozy is, I pitch it as the evolution of the Unix philosophy. What do I mean by that? Well, if we're not gonna have humans on a machine and things like Oxset and grep are difficult for machines to use because they're unstructured, AI is maybe changing that, but AI wasn't as um, dominant as it is today as when this idea came out, but I still think this has its merits. Um, 
it's going to be very, very difficult to hack together something that is built on top of SSH and bashisms and things like that. If we're going to make this reliable, secure, minimal, all of the things that I talked about. And so the idea behind Cozy really is let's put structured data within the idea of the Unix philosophy. So the idea of piping output and input between different processes is still very much part of the Cozy philosophy, but these are now controllers and operators, if you will, that have structured data that is passed between them. And humans operate at, a, at an abstraction before it that is a declarative uh, configuration file. And so with Cozy, we're just, we're not trying to squash the idea of the Unix philosophy. We're trying to evolve it into this idea of let's make it structured and let's have controllers be the things that are the pipes and the outputs. And between those things, they can, they can achieve a lot. And Talos is the prime example of that. It is built entirely on top of Cozy. I bring this only, I bring Omni up here. It is our paid product. I am bringing it up here um, only because I want to use it as an illustration of what I think is going to be really sort of next generation, if you will, of, um, of management solutions for people that are that this really only enabled because we have something like Talos. Uh, if Talos fails and if Omni fails, so be it, but I do think that some of the things that we're doing here at Sidera Labs can really move our industry forward. And I think Omni is an example of that. Um, Omni is built explicitly to run Talos um, and it manages Talos. And I wanna illustrate kind of how, how this works fundamentally to kind of show the benefits of an API. So let's talk about how Omni works real quick. So let's imagine you wanna create a cluster with Omni. What you do is you spin up Talos Linux with some kernel parameters. Those kernel parameters are parsed very early on within the Talos um, boot process. And those kernel parameters tell Talos where to ship its logs and how to log into Omni and gives it credentials to not even log into Omni, but register itself with Omni and where to ship events. Um, I didn't really go into events too much within Talos, but there is a whole eventing system within Talos. We can publish events. Everything that happens within Talos, you can consume remotely. And so with something like Omni, when a machine comes up and says, okay, I'm going to join Omni. And what it does is it, it establishes a point-to-point -point wire guard connection very, very early on. And what we can do from there is since it is secured using WireGuard, we can use the Talos APIs before Talos is ever even given a configuration file. So we can go in and we can say, okay, Talos, tell me how many disks you have. What are their sizes? Tell me about the CPUs you have. We can probe the whole system and pre present that within Omni as a machine that you can then go and make decisions about. And so Omni is a Kubernetes management solution, but it allows you to bring your own machine. So we have customers that are going in and saying they're getting cloud-like experience with something like Talos and Omni. I think uh, because of the fact that we have uh, an operating system that uses an API. We can go in and we can we can validate things. We can get events from it. Everything is structured and it's just way more robust, way more secure because of the fact that we have Talos Linux. And again, I'm only bringing it up because I want to see our industry, you know, sort of move forward with this idea of cozy, whether it be cozy or not. I'm okay with it not. Um, I just want to work with this group in particular to ask ourselves how can we start what is do we want to do this and how can we bring this idea into kubernetes more natively and i think that a perfect place to start is with the kublet the interface of the kublet with the operating system so that's it i plan for about 30 minutes of spewing all kinds of nonsense and um, letting people ask questions after that so i will stop there That was a great presentation, Andy. Thank you. Um, it's it's very interesting to seeing a very determined uh, and dedicated approach um, with, with this special purpose operating system. Uh, because my time's pretty limited here, but I mean, my my other folks uh, will, will drive to conversation. Are you in Paris? Um, 
I personally am not, but our team will be. I believe well, Justin will be there. Maybe we should sync up. Um, what I, what I, this is just a personal impression. Right? What I find intriguing is um, that uh, we both drive uh, our very own kind of philosophies of um, of uh, special purpose operating systems. And like the, the API driven approach of Talos is I think pretty unique. Uh, not seen this before. Yeah, so. uh, we're pretty much the only, that is sort of the defining thing about mm -hmm. Um, we are, I, I don't know of anyone else who has done this. Yes, maybe one smaller, but that's just purely technical uh, question that comes up. You mentioned that you're using squash of S uh, and you're being immutable. Do you have any, uh, security device? Do you have any protections in place for people who maybe fiddle with the squash of S in the boot partition, um, and persist like stuff this way? Yeah, that's what our trusted boot is for. Um, ah, perfect. Not so it's signed. Your boot. We can actually like validate the um, the init RAM FS and the kernel itself. We're the only Linux distro that can go to this degree. A lot of the others use shims that kind of partially validate things. Talos is completely validated using the secure boot process. Um, and then we can encrypt the disk using TPMs so people can't go in and fiddle with things. So yeah, we definitely have, have thought through that. Awesome. Nice presentation, Andrew. Um, you were mentioning at some point that uh, you want to kind of uh, minimize, if I understood correctly, like the user interaction and also like where uh, directly with the OS uh, and, and where they put data and all of that. Um, mm -hmm. Are users abusing the system extensions uh, in, in some kind of way? Or have you felt that uh, people are properly following uh, the design there? People are definitely using system extensions and system extensions do have guardrails that, you know, they don't allow people to do anything arbitrarily. Um, a lot of the system extensions are for things like I want a different, you know, I, I want to like a good one is the NVIDIA stuff. Uh, if you're using a more traditional Linux distribution, the NVIDIA operator goes in and actually compiles kernel modules for you and it does all kinds of craziness. Um, that is not possible within Talos because again, the KSPP guidelines require that the kernel modules be signed with the throwaway key. So the system extensions, we one of the prime examples is that we do all of that at build time. Every version of Talos gets its own unique system extension for the NVIDIA stuff. Um, people are doing things like that. iSCSI is another popular one. Um, there's even a, a, I keep wanting to say tailwind because I keep looking at UI stuff recently, but it's tail scale. Uh, there's a tail scale one. There's actually a lot. Um, it's, it, you can almost imagine it as our package manager. It is our apt, but it just kind of operates on a fundamentally different principle. So yeah, people are definitely using it. Um, you could even use it to add kernel modules if you wanted to. Got it. Thanks. Hey, great presentation. Um, I'm curious about, you said it runs on a variety type of hardware. So Raspberry Pis to like, uh, you know, server class hardware. Um, and you also said it's like really small. How are you balancing like com people coming in with like bizarre um, hardware and making sure you can support that in a way that makes sense? Can you, maybe I missed it, but can you tell me how that's accomplished with uh, yeah. your operating system? Um, nine, I mean, 99% of the time, all that really means is just enabling something within the kernel. Um, if there are out of tree drivers that people need, they can use system extensions for that. You can actually just load kernel modules, but they are built with the you know throwaway key and it's all secure mm -hmm. all like it's a Talos. Um, that's more rare, I would say, but if a customer comes along and says, hey, we're finding that our network card isn't coming up for whatever reason, we do a little bit of investigating and realize, okay, we need to enable this kernel driver. Um, we didn't, and, and interesting to note, sort of a side a tangential thing here is um, when we, when I first created Talos, I actually started with there, I forget the name of the tar the target in the make file, but it's like a way to create the most absolute minimum kernel. Right possible yeah. that's what we started with and so for the first six years it was, there was a lot of 
people coming in saying, hey, we need these drivers. But lately, you know, since we've had a lot of enterprise adoption, it's been few and far between that we actually hit that now. So it's, again, it's just really figuring out what needs to be enabled in the kernel. And if it can't be enabled um, in the kernel and it's an out of tree driver, then use a system extension for that. So your system extensions, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All right, interesting. Yep. Uh, one other question on my side. So um, the image is quite small and is running on RAM. Uh, where, where are the users putting all of their stuff, uh, especially when they come with a pretty heavy uh, images on their side, whether it is uh, packages that they normally install on their uh, Linux distro of their choice or their own data? Yeah. So really what you need to start, when you go into the Talos world, it is a paradigm shift. And what you have to start asking yourself is how can I use Kubernetes to achieve what I need? You can imagine Kubernetes as a distributed kernel of sorts. This is how I've been pitching it for years in the sense that it's scheduling across multiple machines and each machine, all they really are, if you really want to boil down Kubernetes to a really basic idea is they are more compute into a larger machine. That is the Kubernetes cluster. They're more RAM, they're more disk space, they're more CPU. Um, so yeah, really you have to start asking yourself, how can I use Kubernetes? So should, you know, is this something you run on every machine? Okay. Well, Kubernetes has something for that. That's called a daemon set. Is it something that you run as a deployment? That's, you know, you got to start using Kubernetes almost as a package manager itself. Of course, we have people who come along and say, oh, but we don't want our security thing that's monitoring Kubernetes to run in Kubernetes itself. And I have a, a whole opinion around security, but Again, we have a fallback for this. This is a system extension then. This will then run as a container within the Talos space, namespace, if you will. And it will run before Kubernetes. Um, and so there are different ways you can achieve what you typically would do in a more traditional operating system. You just have to break out of the old mold of doing things and ask yourselves, how can I use system extensions or Kubernetes to achieve what I need? I mean, a good example is if you really, really loved SSH and you wanted to hold on to it and hug and squeeze it, is you could run a daemon set that has SSH enabled and all of a sudden you have SSH. Run it as a privileged pod, mount up things that you might need. I don't advocate for this, um, but you know there are ways that you can use Kubernetes to do everything that we've done prior to something like Talos Linux. Got it. Uh, okay. And you haven't gotten too much pushback from, uh, I don't know, big companies into, you know, forcing to adopt this Kubernetes mentality? No. And in fact, I wouldn't even say forcing to adopt. What we're finding actually is people, this philosophy and this idea resonates with them. And in fact, we've paid someone to go and find out why do people like us? Come to find out they really, really like us because of the design and because of the philosophy behind it. Um, this way of doing Kubernetes just resonates with every, not every, obviously that's a very, very strong statement, but a lot of the engineers out there really, really resonate with this. And when you take the time to use Talos and you stop and you ask yourselves, you know, is this actually useful and you use it? I've had people come to me and say, you know, at first when I heard about Talos, I thought it was the most ridiculous thing ever, but when I actually use it, I had this epiphany moment, this, the light bulb went off. So we're actually finding that people are, it's just resonating and we're growing like crazy and we have zero marketing. <laughs> and I think that's largely because we have this grassroots roots movement that is happening with Talos. Like I'm always on Reddit. I mean, I used to have to like cultivate, Hey, check out Talos, blah, blah, blah. But now, oops, pushed my Yubi key and it's yelling. Um, now what we're finding, what I'm finding is when I'm going to all these different forums, I'm finding people just organically loving Talos. And it just, every single praise is, this is how it should be done. And this is exactly, it just resonates with people. Very cool. So with it being ephemeral, uh, is there some part or some uh, amount that's done for things that you don't want ephemeral? like? A, assuming uh, like con container images and uh, yeah. things like that. Talos is installed to a single disk. 
Um, what that all that really means is we're creating a boot partition for Grub, and we have some other like we have a metadata partition that persists. Maybe like it's a place where people can stuff things like um, static. We're getting into like more advanced use cases now, but we have a meta partition. And it's a place where you can stuff sort of node identity, if you will, information. So we're finding a lot of people adopting uh, Talos in bare metal. And this is a place where you can say, hey, you know, we have static IP addresses for every machine. You could just basically say that in the meta partition. So the meta partition, it's not even using a file system. It's it's using something that we took from Sys Linux. It's writing to the block device directly. So there's very early on in the boot process, we can get this node's identity labels that it needs anything for the for the um bare metal use cases but um aside from that there's also slash var which is an xfs partition and that's where kubernetes etcd and container can put all of their data so when i say talos is ephemeral what i mean is the core of it is ephemeral and then kubernetes has its own little space to do what it needs to do cool that makes sense and in future versions of Talos, we're coming out with volume management. It was supposed to be in one seven, but it's looking like it's going to be in one eight, um, where again you're going to have this declarative way of saying I want this partition on this disk, and I want to use it for this use case, and so on and so forth. Um, Justin was saying something. Yeah, something about bottle rocket. Yeah, that's a good point. I think probably Bottle Rocket is the closest um, to to what Talos is, but it's not. I would I would argue that no one has gone to the degree that we have. Um, we have a whole new PID one to make this really done, quote unquote, right. Yeah, and that was actually my question about Bottle Rocket because I know it has a cloud in it, and I wasn't sure how that interacts with. The system D startup process, and if it is still essentially cloud in it under the hood that gets wrapped in Toml, I don't know how that actually gets applied to the system. Yeah, we actually we don't use formalized cloud in it, um, so we use a separate system that's bespoke for that. And then the when you configure it, um, the API that's basically read in uh, becomes the um, uh, the configuration. So they're they're kind of one and the same. That's what I was pecking out below. So yeah, it's it's I think very similar from what I'm I'm hearing. I'd like to look more at Talos just to take a look at that. But like some of the Toml commands are, um, you know, interpreted very very early in the boot process. So Andrew, I have a question about um, the whole um, bootstrapping, especially a Pixie boot process um which is how you all are doing your stuff now on on equinix metal um yep. are there any complications to that does it look very straightforward uh can you bootstrap using something like netboot.xyz which has a lot of operating systems that you can run yeah. like talk talk me through the what happens before before talos gets running if that's anything special or not it's it's actually not. In fact, it's probably more simple um, because with other operating systems, you gotta you know figure out how you get deliver the kickstart file and all of these things in order to do this fully automated. With Talos, it is just two assets. It's an initramfs, and it is a kernel. That is the entirety of Talos. That's all you need to Pixie boot. So yes, netboot.xyz works. In fact, you could even um, I was talking about our factory dot talos dot dev you could even pixie boot from it it offers a public pixie boot endpoint so you could say i want gpu enabled for any version of talos and you could pixie boot saying here's my schematic id now i need the same flavor of talos but for the next version of it and it'll dynamically build it for you if the assets haven't already been built by some other requests and ship them back to you so you can pixie boot directly off of that even and it, it is very simple you just boot those two assets which is basically what pixie booting is it's an internet an inter ram fs and a kernel and you're off to the races and the reason we could do this and make it more simple is because when you first boot talos if there is that we have a kernel argument it's talos.config um we will look 
for there's there's actually two kernel arguments that kind of play into this. There's talos.config and talos.platform. And Equinix Metal is a is a supported platform. Um and when you have talos.platform set to Equinix Metal, it'll look at the Equinix Metal metadata endpoint to pull the configuration file, which is gen which is usually used by CloudInit. We don't use CloudInit, but we're sort of hijacking that whole infrastructure to deliver the configuration file to Talos. Um, but if you did not want to put that in the cloud provider, Talos will boot up and say, okay, I have no endpoint in talos.config and I have no platform from which I can pull from. It's gonna boot in what we call maintenance mode. And all that really is, is a very limited set of APIs being exposed so that you can essentially deliver the configuration file to Talos. So it comes up, you, the user says, okay, it's up. I'm going to push the configuration file to it rather than Talos pulling it from somewhere. There is a race condition. Obviously, if it's out on the internet, someone else can find out the IP address, figure out that you're using Talos and deliver it to it. But you could probably detect that fairly easily and just get rid of it. That's where one of the benefits of Omni comes in because we can actually encrypt that channel using WireGuard when it first comes up and we can deliver the configuration file to it. It's one of the key features behind it. But again, going back to Pixie booting, it's just a matter of, okay, let's just say in the Pixie boot process, I need this in MMFS and this kernel, boom, it comes up. Now you can use Talos CTL to just push the configuration file to it. It's actually one of the more simpler Pixie boot distros, Pixie bootable distros out there, I would argue. Very nice, thanks. I, I hadn't seen the uh, image factory before and that looks like a really good. Yeah, good it's relatively point. new but um it's super cool yep in fact we should probably document that at Equinix metal ed <laughs> let's 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 do that because <laughs> i know that we had when we went to the pixie boot is the best way to support talos decision um i think we need to persist with the documentation efforts because yep you've got platform support. So, you know, we know it's going to work or if it right. doesn't, we know you're going to make it work. Right. Um, yep. Absolutely. So, That's probably right. the best route for, for Equinix metal users for sure. Okay. And are those, is the factory. So if someone is at the far corners of the planet booting off the factory, have you tested the worst case of halfway around the globe? Stop. That is a great question. Um, the good news is I think the entirely the entire deliverable is maybe 150 megabytes. Okay. So I would imagine it would be very difficult to make it noticeable, but obviously we should test that. Um, and we need to look into that. Okay, I'll I'll make a note of it to catch you later, and yes. um, we can spin up infrastructure in. Uh, whatever the far corners of the planet are, depending on what your infrastructure is, and and just see steps. Yeah, some I'd be curious for sure. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, Andrew. This was good. Yeah. yeah you're welcome. It's short, sweet, kind of the the whole idea behind Talos, straight to the point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, thanks again. All right, thank you guys. Um, did have one other quick thing on the agenda, uh, just mentioning about KubeCon. We are, you know, we do have a panel discussion there. I think there are some other talks. Um, there's a thread that was started in our Slack channel yesterday. If there's uh, any other special purpose operating system related talks or things going on, uh, that'd be great if folks could put it there so we kind of have a collection going. Um, yeah, otherwise, I, I think uh, for those of us in the panel on Friday, uh, Tyler had to drop, but mentioned probably the best thing I would think is we can just find some time to get together during the week and just go over what, you know, some of the things, make sure that we cover everything we want to cover and stuff like that. Sounds like a plan. Right. Uh, any last things before we call this meeting? All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Oh, Take care. Hopefully, nice. you get to see some of your faces. Nice day. Ciao. <laughs> thanks. Bye.